Welcome to another evening of Frank Conversation here on Hard Copy, coming to you from our studios in Abuja. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. It's still October, the month of Nigeria's independence anniversary, and there's so much to talk about, and rightly so too, as we reflect on our journey of nation building, how far we've come if we're on the right path, and what the future of this country will be many years from now. Tonight, I speak with an elder statesman, His Royal Majesty Oba Oluyemi Falai, the monarch of Iluabo in Akure North Local Council of Ondo State. Oba Falai is a man of many parts, having served as secretary to the military government of General Ibrahim Babangida, then briefly as Minister of Finance in the year 1990. He is perhaps more known for his attempt to be president of Nigeria in the dawn of the Fourth Republic when he contested against President Olusegun Basanjo on the platform of the Alliance for Democracy. Oba Olufalaye, Your Royal Majesty, thank you so much for coming on Hard Copy tonight. My pleasure to be here. The thread you've woven through Nigeria's rich tapestry is quite a prominent one, straddling both our democratic and our military experiences. As we continue to reflect on our journey as an independent nation, have there been moments when you were truly proud to be a Nigerian? Well, um, I have no uh, option than to feel proud to be a Nigerian, despite all the issues problems and crises that we, we have. Um, because Nigeria potentially is perhaps one of the greatest countries that God created. Um, the, look at West Africa. Nigeria by size is a small country compared with Burkina Faso, Mali, and those other countries. But by, by population, by, by far the largest country in West Africa. If you look at natural endowments, natural resources, both liquid and solid minerals, most countries in West Africa have none at all. But Nigeria has everyone imaginable, from oil to gas, to gold, to coal, to iron ore, name it. So um, I take it then that you are seeing this glass um, as half full, not half empty. Um, but I'm sure that there will be moments where you will be, you know, wondering why it's been so difficult for us, despite all of the huge resources that we've been endowed with, to, you know, be, be past where we currently are. Because some people will say, oh, we got independence with some other countries about the same time. And those countries have since left us in terms of development indices. Would you agree with them? Well, um, the reasons for our failure to develop as fast as we could have are many. Um, I believe the first is the very uh, nature and character of the country. We are a relatively small country in size, in population, in size, but we have something like 440 distinct and different ethnic and linguistic groups in Nigeria. I don't think there's any other country that has as many as 400 ethnic groups anywhere in the world. So again, that's a peculiarity that has bedeviled our development. In no time at all, it became fashionable. But I want to say, because I'm the only Yoruba here, that is why I'm not being given promotion. Because I'm the only Fulani here, that is why uh, I was not employed. And, and this has poisoned inter-ethnic relationships over the years. And um, also, the bitter political struggles, beginning from around 1962, leading on to the Civil War, have all combined to checkmate our development. 
and this has led to very frequent changes in governance. But in Nigeria, every time the government changes, the policies are changed. And so you have the house, you beat a, a, a wall today, somebody else comes, breaks it down, and starts from foundation again. You will never get to roofing level in that kind of house. So frequent changes of government, changes of policy and changes of regime and of policies are responsible mainly for lack of development in our country. The instability that was brought by civil war, by terrorism, and the ethnic riots, these have all combined to hold Nigeria down. Uh, but for all those differences, I believe Nigeria will be a far greater country today than uh, it has become. So I, I think those are some of the reasons why we have failed to use our resources to develop the country. We are busy fighting one another, uh, changing policies. We have not built on earlier development. Everybody goes back, puts down the building, and set the foundation all over again. Mm. And even more so, I mean, uh, this is even more so during a, a democratic experience. You have, you know, given instances of, you know, from our history and how a lack of continuity of policies has affected very seriously our development. We just concluded uh, very rancorous elections, the clouds of which are not yet behind us as matters are still very much in the Supreme Court. I do not know if you have been watching uh, the depositions that have been made in faraway United States and the controversy that is still surrounding that. Uh, if you have, do you want to share your thoughts with us? Well, yes. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to comment on that subject, simply because uh, almost five years ago, uh, soon after I was 80 years old, I decided to retire voluntarily and permanently from partisan politics. I was then the national chairman of the Social Democratic Party. But at 80, I felt I had done enough. I paid my dues, and I felt it was time to take a rest and allow a younger generation to take over. So since then, of course, subsequently, I was promoted from Oluo of Ilabu to a full-fledged Kabiesi. So on both grounds, I can no longer uh, participate in discussing matters that are partisan in nature. Political, yes, partisan, no. Um, so I'm sorry I will not be able to comment uh, on that subject because the country is divided, those who support one side and those uh, who oppose the other side. So I won't comment on that at all. I'm sorry about it. Fair enough, Kabiesi, but I was just going to ask if you think that there is a middle ground for it. I mean, considering just how rancorous it's, as it has all become and how much divisions it has caused. I believe that the judiciary would adjudicate and uh, take a position on this is a, it's a, My hope that once that is done, we would all accept the judicial intervention and pronouncement, uh, and move on with the rest of our lives. Uh, not everybody will be happy or pleased about the judgment, but as it can be the spirit of one country, in order to give peace a chance, to reign, and for Nigeria to be able to address her problems, we should accept the judgment and move on. Especially at this time when there's so much suffering in the country. The economic situation is frightening. There's so much unemployment. There's so much poverty. There's infrastructural decay. There's terrorism and insecurity. Many, many people cannot pay their children's fees, etc., uh, etc. Et now, with that backdrop, it will be very unfortunate if there should be any political uh, crisis emanating from what is going on in the Supreme Court. Uh, I, I pray that peace will reign in Nigeria, that there be justice, that there be peace, and that be developed. 
All right, I can only say amen to that. But you've touched very briefly on the economy, and you are an economist. You studied the economics in school, and for many years you defended the structural adjustment program um, of the military government, even though it wasn't popular. In recent times, the new government of uh, President Inubu has had to, you know, take some pretty difficult decisions with regards to the removal of subsidy, which is uh, causing an adverse effect in the living standards of the people. Now, I don't know whether you've thought about it, I mean, some of these policies as an economist and some of the steps that have been taken so far. Do you think that these um, steps that have been taken can really lead us on the path to prosperity? Well, I want to thank you very much for this last question. Um, the question of subsidy has been lingering for a very long time. And in the past, I had, had to take positions on the subject. Um, I've always believed that a very large component of the so-called subsidy expenditure has been going to unintended beneficiaries. And that therefore, a way should be found to eliminate it. But to eliminate it in my own system, in a package, my own approach would be that we do whatever is necessary to get our refineries to start working. As a young man, I was one of those who felt that government should control the commanding heights of the economy. But as, as I grew older and had more experience in life and in, this, in, in the public service, it became clear politics even business to politicize it. So politics will never allow government to run anything efficiently and profitably. Therefore, I've now come to the view that the refineries, yes, should be repaired, but should be sold into private ownership and management so that they can be efficiently managed to produce petroleum products for us. Once that is done, the refineries will then refine Nigerian crude in Nigerian refineries managed by private people and sold to Nigerian consumers. Once that is done, I'm sure the price of petroleum products will come down and the issue of subsidy will disappear forever. I admit that subsidy is such a big and sensitive matter that if government does not uh, take quick action, we may have what we call decision paralysis. It may become impossible to take action because there are far too many people, too many interests, piling on top of each other, pressurizing you not to do anything. But at the same time, that's no reason for not doing the need, not doing the preliminary things that will minimize the effect of subsidy removal. As I said, I will have within 18 months, got the refineries repaired and passed into private ownership to refine Nigerian crude for Nigerians and minimize or eliminate dollar involvement in the price of product. That is the answer. Uh, Do I hope you that think... can still be done. But it should have been done before the removal, not after. But um, what has been done has been done. But what needs to be done is to quickly move on that route and get the refineries repaired, managed efficiently to produce refined products for Nigerians. So if yeah. I understand you clearly, you are saying that somehow we've placed the cart before the horse in terms of the removal of subsidy. It would seem so to me, yes. But I'm saying that, that I understand again why the decision was taken when it was taken because it, if, if good decision was not taken, you may not be able to take that decision again. I call it decision paralysis. You remember when uh, Jonathan's regime, when there was a contemplation 
to remove uh, subsidies. Remember what the minister then responsible suffered. Her mother was kidnapped by people who wanted to stop the removal of subsidies. It's not a straightforward economic matter. He, there is a whole mafia uh, involved in this thing. Unfortunately, it's tied up with the interests of the masses, and so there's plot in that. So that's why I said there's a large element of the so-called subsidy going to, I call them, un euphemistically, I call them unintended beneficiaries. Those are the mafia people. I don't want to do the work. Let me quickly take you up on the issue of security. You have also held a short uh, end of the stick there when you were kidnapped in 2015. I imagine that, you know, at least you got some uh, reprieve when the people who perpetrated that were convicted. Um, are, are you a little more comfortable with the steps that have been taken uh, with regards to solving the insecurity problem in our country? Oh, certainly not. Um, certainly, um, some steps have been taken at, at both national and state and local levels to ameliorate the position. That is where I live. The position is far better now than it was when I was getting out. What I mean is that in the last 12 months, no housemen have invaded my family. I thank God for that. And I thank Amotekun for that. Amotekun introduced by those state doctors. And I thank the enactment of the anti-open grazing law by the Ondo State Assembly for that. Those two factors have combined to substantially reduce the threat of uh, violence and terrorism uh, in this state. Of course, people are still being kidnapped. Only a few days ago, a, 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 a choir from one of the churches going to and a neighboring town to a funeral, uh, the entire choir was kidnapped, and uh, people are still looking for it. But there has been a tremendous... Uh, I hear that they've, they've all been uh, re re rescued now, uh, thanks to Amotekun. Yes, the situation in Nondo State is far better. I believe in the Southwest in general, uh, because of the Amotekun network. Um, but I think... I think, and I know the federal government has bought uh, special aircraft, helicopters to, to check terrorism in Kaduna, uh, to fight the S1 in Niger State now. But I think that I want to recommend that every, at least in each state, there ought to be one or two special helicopters equipped to fight and prevent kidnapping and terrorism. Um, when people are kidnapped, before you can drive 50 kilometers to where they are, the terrorists have gone very far into the bush. But if there are like one or two helicopters uh, equipped for that purpose, within five minutes, 10 minutes, it will be in the vicinity. And it will be much easier to rescue kidnapping. So this is a small investment, two helicopters or even one helicopter per state will not, cause, will not break the, the, the treasury and it substantially enhance the power of the Farmatekun and the police to prevent uh, kidnapping and terrorism and to ensure the rescue of those who are kidnapped. Yes, something has been done, but much more needs to be done. Let me say finally on that matter that while the preventive uh, measures have been taken and government goes after the terrorists and kidnappers, we should go to the source of violence and terrorism. You see, if once people feel there is hope, there will be no desperation. But once hope is dead, man, and I mean generic man, will do anything to survive. I believe that poverty and loss of hope and loss of employment opportunities is the primary source of the deterioration in security which we are battling. So that is the final 
solution to the insecurity. Next. Well, Klaviasi, let me take you up quickly on the issue of um, unity. I mean, you have spoken to why it seems it's been very difficult for us to make much progress um, in terms of not only change of policies, but also in terms of the water of unity that have been polluted. Um, do you have any, have you, when you think about it, do you see any way forward um, in terms of making sure that we begin to clean these waters and try to work around achieving unity for our country? Well, thank you very much. Um, you come to a subject on which I can talk for the next three days, if you permit me. Um, yes. I think, the, as I said, the multiplicity of ethnic groups, cultures, and religions is the foundation for a lot of problems. However, I also believe that an effective solution is to moderate the conflicting interests of the various groups. By doing what? By enlarging what the British did before independence. The British recognized that we were not homogeneous as to ethnicity, to tribe, or language, or culture, or religion. And that therefore, for us to coexist peacefully as a country, there must be flexibility that will allow each group to be itself within the same country. Soon after the British left, we reverted to a unity government. The military came and abolished the federal constitution and gave us a quasi unitary constitution. And we've been using variants of that unitary, unitary uh, constitution up to now. Fortunately, in 2014, President Jonathan finally set up a national conference to revisit the subject. And I had the privilege not only of being a delegate, one of the other statesmen delegates at the conference, when we got to the conference, we were able to negotiate with all the groups in Nigeria, and we arrived at what I consider acceptable resolutions of most of the issues dividing us, from religion to revenue sharing to whatever, whatever. And all the 600 plus decisions we took were by consensus. I'm not saying by it, it, decisions are not unanimous, but by consensus. Meaning that the chairman of the conference will put each question to the house and say those who support it say yes or I, those who oppose say no. That's the way I submit. And that if you are not satisfied that I said, raise your hand and will take a vote. I want to say that. Not one single person raised his or her hand throughout that process. In other words, the consensus approach was acceptable to all the delegates, and we passed all the resolutions by consensus. I believe that if Nigeria must continue to have a common unity, have, we must all have the same country and the same destiny, the report of that conference remains, in my humble opinion, the future of this country. Because the decisions were taken by all of us by consensus, I believe it would be difficult to get something superior to that in the divided situation which we are. If the report of that conference were to be adopted tomorrow to guide government in moving forward in Nigeria, I believe gradually the next five, 10 years, we'll have a country where peace, and mutual respect and development will arrive. Because anything that is perceived to be one-sided will be resisted by other people. That report is a consensus document. Nigeria has never produced such a report in, all, in our entire history. Even though there was a report in London, that was, none has been 
decided by consensus in every detail. And there were almost 500 delegates that were representative of the various communities in Nigeria. I believe it represents 80% of what, what, what most Nigerians will agree with and live with. We have that very precious report to use to navigate our way forward as a people. But I do hope that, you know, your uh, admonition is listened to. Um, I, I, we have to thank you at this point, um, Your Royal Majesty, for finding the time to speak with us this beautiful Friday evening. Thank you so much for coming on Hard Copy. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm happy to have talked with you. Well, that's it for this edition of Hard Copy. We look forward to hearing from you. Please use the handles showing on your screen to get some feedback to us. Thank you for watching. I'm Maokwe Ogun Yusuf. Good night.